Okay, so this is the next part of this. I know I'm going a little bit out of order uh, from what your schedule says, and but I'm trying to follow your book. I think uh, having your book accessible and kind of looking at things as we go through here in that chapter um, is going to help. So we're going to look at alter mental status and the most common causes of somebody to have a non-trauma, um, either disorientation, they don't know where they're at, um, or completely unresponsive is going to be a seizure, a stroke, or blood sugar problems, especially low blood sugar. So we're going to look at these. We're going to come back to stroke and uh, diabetes at the end of this lesson. Uh, so it'll be a couple of um, recordings down, but this kind of is the focus is just alter mental status. So it could be a very sudden um, alter mental status. It could be a gradual decrease. Uh, like an older person that has dementia, you know, you go visit your grandmother, your great grandmother, and then uh, next time she's having a hard time, think of your name, and the next time she doesn't recognize who you are. So it could be a gradual decrease and a lot of causes of that. So we're going to use that ABPU scale to assess the mental status. You know, are they responsive and uh, alert? Are they looking at me as I wait, walk in? And I want to make sure if I say they're alert, they know their name, they know the day or date. They know they're, where they're at, and they know what happened. You know, it, and if somebody forgets part of this, I want to be able to identify what that is. I don't just say, well, they're alert and oriented times three um, without telling what that third thing is. You know, it makes a big deal if I say, man, I just, I can't remember what day it is. But if I say I don't remember my name, that's kind of a big deal. Or are they only responsive when I shout at them or when I cause painful stimuli or completely unresponsive? So assessing the patient's mental status, consider two factors. What was their initial level of consciousness and did they have any change in that level? Uh, whether it be a change for the good or, or for the bad. Uh, conditions causing altered little level of consciousness. And we're going to hit a lot of these in trauma, so like a head injury or shock. Uh, but it could just be a decreased level of oxygen to the brain could be a stroke, uh, could be a, a bradycardia, slow heart rate, it could be a fever or infection, uh, poisoning, it could be uh, blood, blood sugar problems, they're diabetic, or maybe they're not even diabetic, uh, but they just didn't eat in a while, that could cause that. Uh, an insulin reaction, maybe um, their, their uh, sugar's too high, they don't have enough insulin. Or it could be a psychiatric condition um, that's causing this. So our initial treatment is going to focus on the ABCs and uh, maintaining normal body temperature, especially if they're feverish. Um, keep from the patient from doing any additional harm to themselves. So if they're unsteady in walking, you know, uh, discourage them from walking around. Uh, if the person is completely unresponsive, does not have trauma, what's the best position that we want them in? We want them in that recovery position. Um, and the reason being is a lot of head injuries in, in a a uh, brain injury can be external like from trauma or it can be internal like a stroke. Both of those vomit. That's what they do. And when the brain starts to swell and the tissue starts to swell inside the skull, it makes the body throw up. So um, that's a very common thing for head injuries to do. So alter mental status uh, should be placed in a, in a recovery position. Have suction available should they begin to vomit. Uh, seizures can be very frightening. Uh, seizures can be um, generalized, and then they can also be an absent seizure. So the ones that we're going to focus on, on here are uh, generalized seizures, what we call grand mal seizures. And it's kind of like having um, uncontrolled electrical impulses in the brain that cause the body to twitch, um, to jerk. A lot of times um, they'll bite, they'll continue like chewing, and they'll bite their tongue or bite the inside of their cheek. Uh, they may become incontinent to bowel or bladder. Um, and then, but most seizures, as scary as they are, only last a couple of minutes. Most of the time when you arrive on the scene, the seizure is over. Uh, they're in what we call a postictal state. Uh, so some people know they're going to have a seizure. It's called an aura. They'll smell something or get a metallic taste in their mouth and they lay down. Some people have uh, seizure dogs. The dogs actually alert them when they're going to have a seizure. Then they have that couple of minutes of tonic-clonic activity, and then they have maybe five to ten minutes of a, of a very uh, sublime uh, postictal coma state afterwards. Leaves them unresponsive. 
um, can be caused by high fever, especially in, in uh, infants and young children. Well, they're called febrile seizures. And once they have that, that seizure, it's not like, oh, they're going to have another one. Because it's not how high their temperature got, it's how fast they got there. Uh, and it's a febrile seizure. If we just cool the child down a little bit, um, that's pretty much it, unless they had any trauma from anything. Most people will still want them taken into the hospital and getting checked out. Um, an absent seizure is just a brief last lapse of consciousness. So uh, patients uh, may be staring, they may blink, uh, they may actually have a seizure in one part of their body, but it's called an absent seizure. And uh, usually these people know that they have um, this condition, like a pettit mal seizure or a focal motor seizure in one part of their body. And uh, there's not usually much um, risk of um, anything medical going on unless they're driving, of course, but uh, with a generalized seizures, um, the problem is they're not adequately breathing. So the longer the seizure, the longer they go without breathing and it makes them low in oxygen. So after the seizure, we wanna monitor the patient's ABCs and arrange for transport. Um, you wanna look at, did they have any trauma associated with that seizure? Did they collapse and fall? Uh, did they bite their tongue? Did they bite their cheek? You know, Do you need to suction the airway? Uh, most of the time seizures are caused by epilepsy, so it's a condition that that person knows they have a history of seizures and they're usually controlled uh, with anti-seizure medications that they take. Uh, some people can't afford them or they run out or they build up a tolerance to it and they need to go back to the doctor and have them changed so they may have a seizure occasionally. It could be caused by trauma, head injury, uh, stroke, or shock, so a number of reasons that it can be caused. Any of these can cause a, a seizure. As far as the complications of pregnancy, it has to do with blood pressure when they get really high blood pressure. And we call that state um, preeclampsia. And then when they actually have the seizure, we call it eclampsia. So we cover that again in our, in our pregnancy lesson. So what do you do? You walk in, um, into the house and somebody's actively seizing. What if they are? And uh, the natural tendency is to want to hold them down. Well, don't do that. Just protect them from injury. If they're near a wall, slide them to the middle of the room. Just take a towel, fold it a couple of times, and put it under their head so they're not hitting their head on the floor. Don't put a big pillow under their head. You're going to occlude their airway by flexing that head and neck. So um, just kind of protect them from injury. Um, if they're seizing. I know a lot of people here, well, they're going to swallow their tongue. Their eyes are rolled back and it looks terrible. Well, you physiologically can't swallow your tongue, but you could bite it. Uh, so you could put a padded bite stick uh, and it's just tape wrapped around it. It looks like a big uh, it's tongue depressor. It looks like a big uh, popsicle stick. And uh, that's a padded stick that you can put between their teeth as, if they're biting. If, if you have to pry their teeth open, don't worry about it. They're not biting anything. Um, if the seizure's over, uh, roll them on their side, you know, make sure the airway's open, uh, keep them in that recovery position until help arrives. Protect them from embarrassment. A lot of times they have had uh, bowel and bladder accidents. It, they can't control it. It's just part of, you know, the whole body responding to this. So uh, protect them from embarrassment on something like that. If um, they don't resume breathing on their own in just a little bit, start with mouth to mask. Uh, resuscitation or breathing if you have a, a bag mass and you can try that for the most part though after the seizure um, they're really disoriented so they slowly wake up and uh, you have to orient them it's okay it's okay EMS is here uh, you had a seizure do you remember that and you just slowly bring them back to that uh, uh, orientation of where they are uh, move them into a private place. It could be the ambulance because a lot of these have to go to the hospital and say, you know, I'm on anti-seizure meds. Why did I have a seizure? Um, so um, the more you know about medical conditions, the more knowledgeable you're going to be on this. And it's easy to take each one of these and think about all the situations that could fall under each of these categories um, so that you don't have to go on a bunch of calls to be able to, to acquire that kind of experience and knowledge. So we're going to stop here and continue on with heart conditions. It'll be our next uh, topic that we go over, cover heart attack and angina.